Thank you, Pastor Ed. One more time tonight, uh, hand out a syllabus to you. This is number 13 in this series as we close it out tonight. By now you should have a pretty good book there at your house on all of these notes. Those of you who are watching at home, you can download the syllabus right on your computer. There ought to be a place on the screen there that says download or syllabus or something. You like these clear-cut uh, explanations, but you can download the syllabus right there. Just take you a couple minutes, and you can have the same information in your hands that the folks have here in the uh, sanctuary. I have a <clears throat> lot of books in my library, both here in my study and, and then the study I have at the house. I, I'm a book fiend. I'm not wild about uh, these little Kindles and Nooks. My wife does all that, but I like a book. I like the feel of a book, the heft of a book, the aroma of a book. I like to turn pages. And um, when I get on the airplane, uh, the stewardess never says, turn off your book. <laughs> I like that. I'm sometimes asked when people walk into my studies, have you read these books? Yes. Do you have a favorite? Yeah, I suppose there's uh, books that would comprise my favorite. For the most part, they'd be biographies, I suppose, or specialized history books. But, but without question, one of my top five favorite books is a tiny little volume that was written about 80 years ago by an attorney who grew up in church and never had much interest in church at all because the Jesus that he was taught about was so boring to him as a little boy that he just kind of logged out on it. But as he got older, he began to think nobody in history has ever so profoundly impacted society as Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that wherever Jesus was in ministry, he was surrounded, the King James Version says, he was surrounded by multitudes of people. They were attracted to him. There was something about Jesus that was so magnetic. And today, churches close in droves. And yet the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this attorney wrote this little book called The Man Nobody Knows. And he began to do some deep research written by men who knew Jesus personally, such as Matthew, such as John, and he began to devour their biographies out of those two Gospels that open up the New Testament. And he found himself embracing a Jesus he'd never heard about in his whole life. The Jesus that he'd heard about and that we hear about today is so politicized, is so sterile, is so dull, that people aren't interested in him. If you read the Gospels with an open mind, you're going to find that in Jerusalem, the most popular dinner guest in Jerusalem was Jesus. Okay, good night. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Jesus said, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is a party. That's not the Jesus you hear about today. I am as convinced as I can be that down through the centuries of time, theologians and churchmen or women, whatever reason, have switched Jesus. They brought in a ringer. And he's not very much fun and he's not very interesting. But the Jesus of the Bible is incredible. 
So the study on Wednesday night, starting next Wednesday night and throughout the summer, will be the Jesus Nobody Knows. I want you to come, bring somebody with you. Be prepared to be shocked. Be prepared to vote me out of this church. <laughs> because we're going to study Jesus as he really is. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. There's a reason. It wasn't Muhammad that split the ages. It wasn't even Franklin Roosevelt who split the ages. It wasn't even Ronald Reagan. It was Jesus. Jesus literally split the ages. We say before Christ, after Christ. Now today, especially with some of my academic friends over in Israel, they say, before the common era, after the common era. And I always ask them, uh, the common era was when? It was the time of Jesus. Oh, yeah. Right. Jesus split the ages. Must be an incredible person. We'll start to study him next week. Tonight, eternity. We'll talk about eternity. Here again, we're talking about a subject that nobody talks about very much. And yet, you're going to be spending forever there. Forever and ever. In the box on page one, today we close this general study with a glimpse into eternity, infinite time, duration without beginning or end, eternal existence contrasted with mortal life, the timeless state into which the soul will pass at death regarded as timeless or eternal. Now I'm going to get to the notes as soon as I can, but I want to open up my heart to you. Today, we are facing a thing in America. It's kind of a dumbing down of America. When I first started on Revival Time back in 1979, and Revival Time was the national global radio ministry of the Assemblies, we were on 600 stations every week. Whatever I wrote in the script or in the messages could not go beyond a seventh grade level of education. You can judge what level you're reaching. It's called the fog index. Anything, and we knew this. Everybody in broadcasting knew this, and I came out of commercial broadcasting. Same thing with the news. Back in those days, in 79, if you exceeded the level of a seventh grade mentality, it just whew, went right over people's heads. The average comprehension in 1979 was seventh grade. Today, it is third grade. It's the dumbing down of America. And in the church, it's the, uh, how can I put this? In church after church, it's not the great truths of eternity that drive us because we don't know much about eternity. It's, uh, what can you do for me? Uh, do you have any classes on uh, cake decorating in Sunday school? You say, you're kidding. I caught one being taught here that I didn't know about. Cake decorating on Sunday morning. There's still a little spot on the ceiling where I hit it. <laughs> what can you do for me? It's not what can you do for Christ. There is a lessening and lessening of any eternal concept whatsoever. Entertain us. If you don't, we'll go over to the next church, and then we'll go to the next. There are, we pastors know, don't want to shock you here, but we pastors know, and we know who they are, there are thousands of people in this county 
who just go from church to church to church to church to church to church to church. They go to wherever the spout is where the glory happens to be coming out at that particular time. Well, I don't understand that. I wasn't raised that way. I wrote a little, uh, I wrote a little thing for my kids uh, last year called uh, My Life in the Arena. This is not a publication for general, but it's for my kids. To tell them about how their dad and their granddad and their great-granddad grew up. And, and the things that are of timeless essence to me and the stability of the church, the theology of the church, the practices of the church, which Jesus loves and gave himself for it, have changed down through the years. They have radically changed down through the years because there's not a whole lot of eternal concept. I'll just read a little bit of this, and, and that's all. My parents had little interest in the gospel until the death of my baby brother in 1935. In fact, my mother was very involved with the occult. Until cancer later ravaged her body, mother was an incredibly beautiful woman. Her appearance, her dominating personality, and her powers in the occult drew many people to her events. Many who remember those days have related to me how she could begin to call the spirits and the table in front of her would begin to move back and forth and even slither clear across the room. So to say the gospel was not part of the life of my mom and dad in their early years of marriage is an understatement. And then my older baby brother, born in July of 1935, died after four days of life. He's buried at Graceland Cemetery in Sioux City, Iowa. My folks never even gave him a name. Now, perhaps for the first time, they were impressed by the fragility of life and began to look for something of substance. There's the word. Of substance they had not found before. They got involved in a small church on the west side of Sioux City, First Assembly of God, pastored by a man of monumental faith. His name was Willis Smith, who's long since with the Lord. The miraculous healing of Faye Montang, my cousin, about that time brought even in more of our relatives. She was dying of cancer. She was, in fact, in a coma. Pastor Willis Smith prayed for her, and God miraculously healed her. She lived for another 45 years or so, a lovely woman who had quite good health after her healing. Both of my parents were strong witnesses for the Lord, and many came to Christ because of that, especially among our relatives. I can still remember a revival meeting in the early 40s when the evangelist Charles Blair had family night. There were over 50 members of my family in that one service. I believe that the reason my folks moved from the big town of Climbing Hill, Iowa, to Sioux City was because of their love of God and the church there. Prior to their move, every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, Dad would load us in that old 32 Chevrolet Cabriolet. And rain or snow or sun, we would head down the gravel road, the gravel road, the gravel road to Sioux City and the church, a distance of 30 miles each way. Today on paved roads and powerful cars with good tires, that would not be a big deal. But back in those days of easily punctured tires, dreadful winters, bad roads, snow drifts, and blizzards, it was quite an effort to get to the church. And we never missed, ever, because it was God's house. Today, well, we're going to try to get there, Pastor, but the weatherman said it possibly could rain, and you know how lethal it is when it sprinkles. <laughs> Cannot tell you how cold that leaves me. I mean, what... 
what has happened to the substance of Christians? There are people in this world who would give their lives to be in church and do. Well, pastor, the wind may blow. It may sprinkle, so we can't make it. And, you know, over here at this church, they're having this person, this church, they're having this person. Who do you have first assembly tonight? And we'll think, it's not about Jesus. It's not about eternity. It's about what pleases me and is convenient for me. Just one more little paragraph. Without question, the single most life-forming institution of my life was our church. There's no question about that. That's why when I drove by it last summer and found out that the church had lost its vision and its mission and is now today a Buddhist temple, shows how quickly people lose their very reason for existing. So this study tonight on eternity is, in my estimation, the most important of the 13 that we have studied so far. Eternity drives me. I'm often, I've often had said to me, Pastor, you're getting older, and yet your drive, your passion level, not my physical strength, but your passion level increases because I'm awfully close to getting there. And that will motivate you. I have to stand before God. You know, I've been here almost 25 years. Certainly within the next much less the time than that, I'll be giving an audit to him. That drives me. That drives me. Not to a presbytery board, not to a general superintendent, but to the God who made me. You say, oh, poor you. No, it's going to be a grand time, I think. The question is, how's it going to be for you? Because you're going to be there too. One-on-one, -on -one, Pastor, can you help me? No. Can my wife help me? No. One-on-one, -on -one, you stand before God. And the Bible says the books are opened and you give an account. We've gone through this whole thing now with, with uh, Harold Camping and choosing a day for the rapture. That's idiocy. So don't believe the October 21st one either. <laughs> if you can take an American once, by Ned, you can take him twice. We don't know when Jesus is coming, but in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus said, when you see all these things start to happen, it, it's like a fig tree. When it starts to put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So when you see all these things starting to come to pass, know that it is nigh. On the bottom paragraph on page one, I've just listed some things that are crazy things that are happening. I was supposed to fly to Omaha in the morning, and I'm not going to Omaha in the morning because when I'm supposed to catch the return flight to come back on a, on a mission that was really very important to me. According to the guys at Epley Field in Omaha last night, they said, we hope that the, that the runway will be dry Saturday, but there could be 10 feet of water on it because the Missouri River has gone crazy. And a whole list of these things. Now, I'm going to show you a video that was sent me this week, and it starts off slow. It lasts about six minutes, but I want you to watch this video. This is of a of a little town in Japan. And when the earthquake hit and the resulting tsunami, some Japanese students, and everything you will hear will be in Japanese, and I don't have a clue what they're saying. But they're up on a bluff overlooking their village watching the water come in. They just wanted to see the water splash on the shore. And what they saw is absolutely breathtaking. I want you to watch this. Roll it. Uh, 
that mist rolling in is the, is the water. やべえ、俺見てもだめ。うわ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべえ。やべ
really? <laughs> oh, really? Our house is at six feet above sea level. Where's yours? And things that we hang on to that become so precious to us that our whole lives are bound up in them can be taken away just like that. But those things that cannot be shaken, which have to do with eternity, that's a whole different thing. We take a lot of time trying to prop up and salvage those things that can be shaken. I told you a few weeks ago, while we were in church one Sunday morning, somebody broke into our house and stole a bunch of stuff. Well, it's irritating, but it's stuff. It's just stuff. But those things that cannot be shaken will remain. So we talk tonight about eternity. Top of page two, do we live in fear? No. Somebody asked me the other day, all these crazy things happening. I watched, I watched at 6 o'clock tonight. I turned on the webcam in the Missouri River. I saw homes floating down the Missouri River. So do we live in fear? Jesus said no. John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. Why? You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Everything has to do with eternity. The news should not frighten you. It ought to alert you to the fact that eternity is the main thing in your whole life. Are you ready for it? What's eternity going to be like? Starting on page 2, line 17, you can follow along with the script or you can watch the screen. This is breathtaking information written to you personally by the Holy Spirit. Watch. The angel showed me a river that was crystal clear and its waters gave life. The river came from the throne where God and the Lamb were seated. Then it flowed down the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river are trees that grow a different kind of fruit each month of the year. The fruit gives life, and the leaves are used as medicine to heal the nations. God's curse will no longer be on the people of that city. He and the Lamb will be seated there on their thrones. And its people will worship God and will see Him face to face. God's name will be written on the foreheads of the people. Never again will night appear, and no one who lives there will ever need a lamp or the sun. The Lord God will be their light, and they will rule forever. Then I was told, these words are true and can be trusted. The Lord God controls the spirits of his prophets, and he is the one who sent his angel to show his servants what must happen right away. Remember, I am coming soon. God will bless everyone who pays attention to the message of this book. My name is John, and I am the one who heard and saw these things. Then after I had heard and seen all this, I knelt down and began to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown it to me. But the angel said, don't do that. I am a servant just like you. I am the same as a follower or a prophet or anyone else who obeys what is written in this book. God is the one you should worship. Don't keep the prophecies in this book a secret. These things will happen soon. Evil people will keep on being evil, and everyone who is dirty-minded will still be dirty-minded. 
but good people will keep on doing right, and God's people will always be holy. Then I was told, I am coming soon. And when I come, I will reward everyone for what they have done. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God will bless all who have washed their robes. They will each have the right to eat fruit from the tree that gives life, and they can enter the gates of the city. But outside the city will be dogs, witches, immoral people, murderers, idol worshippers, and everyone who loves to tell lies and do wrong. Jesus, and I am the one who sent my angel to tell all of you these things for the churches. I am David's great descendant, and I am also the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Everyone who hears this should say, If you are thirsty, come. If you want life-giving water, come and take it. It's free. Here is my warning for everyone who hears the prophecies in this book. If you add anything to them, God will make you suffer all the terrible troubles written in this book. If you take anything away from these prophecies, God will not let you have part in the life-giving tree and in the holy city described in this book. The one who has spoken these things says, I am coming soon. So, Lord Jesus, please come soon. I pray that the Lord Jesus will be kind to all of you. In order to have some comprehension of eternity, we need to broaden our comprehension of who God is. We don't know much about God, despite the fact the Bible tells us volumes about him, his nature, his attributes, his decrees, but we're content not to know a whole lot about him. So the whole concept of eternity gets lost to us, despite the fact that we know God is the creator of eternity, and he himself is eternal. Eternity, eternal. On line 20, it's difficult for us mortals to conceive of eternity because we are so bound up in time. But a basic comprehension of God's infinity in relation to time will help us. Now, these next paragraphs are written by Dr. Henry Thiessen, whom I absolutely adore and devour his lectures in systematic theology. Line 27, God is without beginning and without ending. See, this throws the critic, well, who created God? Well, the minute you ask a question like that, you are admitting that you are bound up in time. Who started God? Started. Where did this commence? But God has always been, and we can't comprehend that. The general secretary of the Assemblies of God is a former uh, space scientist and um, brilliant. He has his, his doctorates are in space science. And I sit across the table from him at the executive presbytery meeting, Dr. Jim Bradford, and when he, 
when he gives the devotions to start our meetings, I sit there with pen in hand because the stuff that comes from this man, they move me to my toes. The critics, the idiots on television who criticize the Bible and make fun of it don't have a clue what they're talking about. I mean, they show you that their, their reading is just about, oh, oh, see, John, run, spot, run. But there are brilliant academicians who study this and take us. Dr. Jim Bradford says, you know, we understand three basic elements of life. And, and to us, everything is bound up in these three categories of life. And it's been that way since time memorial, that this is who we are and it's bound up. And there's nothing beyond that. But now we know differently with our space travel, with our probing into dimensions where man has never dared to go, we know there are not three levels of elements. There are 11 that we have never known, eight of them that we have never dreamed even existed. And God is somewhere bound up in that. We can't even comprehend that. Because we just sing simple little songs and simple little scriptures and have our little scripture verses for the day and yet never delve into the fact of God is eternal. God is without beginning. He's without ending. Can't conceive of that. He is free from all succession of time. The Bible tells us that to God, a day is just a second of time. It's a moment. It's a twinkling of an eye. That being the case, to God, Jesus died a couple minutes ago. Because time loses all of its momentum when you start thinking about eternity. He is free from all succession of time. He is the very cause of time. He's always existed and always will exist. And I give you a bunch of scriptures there. Go to the top, page four. God is free from all succession of time. For example, we say, I'm so many years old, and next year I'll be one year older than that. We understand succession of time. That's all we can pick up on. But God has a simultaneous possession of his total duration so that the whole of the divine knowledge and experience is ever before the divine being so they are not parts succeeding parts. You say, I don't understand that. Me either. Except that at no time has God ever done this. I didn't know that. He's free from all succession of time. To God, a billion years ago is just as relevant as this very moment. And the same can be said about a billion years from now. A lot of Christians are all hung up on this 7,000 year thing. Give me a break. God has always been. He is the cause of time. Hebrews 1, 2, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the word, the worlds. Hebrews eleven three. 3, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the very word of God, the spoken word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And time will someday merge into eternity. When, Pastor, the moment you stop breathing or the moment Jesus comes, time's over. I preached a message up in uh, somewhere about the judgment seat of Christ and Paul, I tried to dramatize Paul standing before the judgment seat of Christ and it's just my imagination, but everything we've ever done is going to come before God and all the books are gonna be opened, I mean everything. And I, I tried to imagine Paul. We know that Paul walked at least 8,000 miles in three missionary journeys. He walked it. And uh, he, he's the first man to invade Europe. I mean, he built these, he started these congregations all, all over Europe and all over Asia Minor. And I'm trying to comprehend, 
God says, what do you have to declare, Paul? And Paul says, I've got all these things. And the angels start bringing in all of these boxes and barrels and luggage in which, in my imagination, comprise all of the deeds that Paul ever did. And, and in my reverie here, somebody nudges me and says, hey, Betzer, that, that's all Paul's? Look at that stack of stuff. Is he going to open up all that stuff? Yeah. Man, we're going to be here a long time. No. There is no time. There's no such thing as time or succession of time. Let you think about that. Here's some questions about living in eternity that aren't quite so esoteric. How do we know anything about heaven and eternity at all? There are, there are some interesting books written by people who claim they've died and gone to heaven or had a vision of heaven or hell, and I don't question them. That may be true. They're just not substantive witnesses. But I have a friend who has been there. He's been to heaven and he's been to hell, literally. And gave us a tremendous description of it. It's written in a book called The Bible. That's how we know about it. This guy Rob Bell writes a book and he says, well, hell is relative. And, and, and this is a pastor, by the way, who wrote this. Hell is relative and God's going to let us everybody off the hook. Well, the guy who's been there and back has a different story to tell you. So I think you maybe want to read Jesus before you read Rob Bell. How do we know anything about heaven? The Bible tells us. Will we recognize our loved ones in heaven? 1 Corinthians 13, 12. This is line 30. Now we see through a glass darkly. Uh, back in Paul's day, there was no such thing as clear glass. There were no mirrors in Paul's day. The Romans, if you were the wealthiest emperor in the world, you didn't have a beautiful mirror to look in and comb your hair. You had a bronze vase or a bronze polished piece of metal or some kind of Roman glass that was not clear glass. And it, did, it gave you a distorted, muddied image of yourself. That's why Paul wrote, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Will we know each other in heaven? Of course. I give you the story from uh, Luke 9, the disciples up there on Mount Hermon, which I believe is the Mount of Transfiguration, where they see Moses and Elijah. <laughs> I don't care which version of the Bible you read. Neither one of those two guys, as Moses or Elijah, were wearing a name badge. And yet the disciples said, whoa, that's Moses, that's Elijah. Somehow they just knew. Well, we know Jesus' men recognize these giants. Top of page five, will there be anyone in heaven who's committed suicide? Yeah, I think so. Not all of them, but I think some. Suicide, by and large, is an irrational act. It has to do with the mind. A person who is rational and making clear-cut judgment is not going to take his life. If he does take his life and he's rational, then he's going to have to give an account to God for it and be held responsible for the taking of life. But I've been involved down through ministry and in the news business with quite a few suicides. And many of them, many of them happened because the people were totally out of their mind. Um, so I wrote, I believe the answer is yes, not across the board to be sure, but it's conceded even by many theologians that some who take their lives were not rational or in the right minds when the suicide happened. Someone has observed from Scripture that it appears that only unrepented sin locks heaven's door. God judges the heart. We say if a little child, God bless him, a little child passes away, the child is safe in the arms of Jesus because he does not have the rationale to come to God and say, I recognize that I am a sinner, forgive me. God does not violate a mind that cannot comprehend what is happening. So we believe in the sanctity of children. That's why we don't baptize them. We dedicate them. 
But when they come to the age of accountability, when they begin to understand what they should be doing, then God holds them responsible. Well, we have emotions in heaven. Line 17, St. Augustine observed, in heaven the joy that we receive from God in our souls will overflow into our resurrection bodies in a voluptuous torrent of pleasure. And we read about Jesus in Hebrews 12 too, who for the joy that was set before him, not the cross, that was coming up the next day. That was not going to be a joy, that would be horror. But for the joy that awaited him when he ascended back to the Father, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So joy is only one of the emotions we'll enjoy throughout eternity. Thankfully, missing will be sadness and heartache. Revelation 7:17. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Notice that writ is written in Revelation 7. Hey, we are still a long ways from Revelation 7. So there are many times when followers of Christ, dedicated followers of Christ, have great, great sadness and weep many tears. I wrote a sermon one time for revival time called, But What About the Weeping? Back in those days when, uh, when the faith movement was at its torrent, and I'm a great believer in faith, but not abusive faith. And uh, we were being taught, you know, in some of the media, if you sneeze, you're confessing a cold. Um, if you say, I have a cold, it's probably the demon of unbelief in you. Well, that's all hooey. If I sneeze, it's because my nose is all filled up with gunk and it's got to get out of there. And we were also being taught that if you're a Christian, you'll never have tears and nothing bad will ever happen to you. You'll probably be worth millions of dollars and drive a Bentley. And that's all hooey, you know. Jesus said in this world, in this world, you will have tribulation. And there's weeping, but the Bible says weeping only lasts for the night and joy comes in the morning. So if you're going through a difficult time, my friend, don't let somebody, Job's comforter, say to you, well, something wrong with you or you wouldn't be going through this. How do they know? Judge not that you be not judged. You might be, you're going through a difficult time because you're, you're having a difficult time. Sometimes family members pass away. And sometimes we lose possessions. Sometimes our health starts to disappear. Doesn't mean you're less of a believer. But one of these days, God will wipe away all tears, hallelujah, from our eyes. Number five, will we not mourn for our loved ones who are lost? I don't think so. It's fascinating insight into the mind of Jesus in Matthew 7, 23. He'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jesus actually says he never knew the lost person. Blotted from memory. Think of it. If you miss heaven, my friend, if you ignore God's salvation paid for by Christ's death on the cross, all memory of you among your friends and family will be blotted out for time and eternity. Do you ever stop to think about that? There are not going to be prayer meetings for you in heaven. It's over. It's appointed unto man one time to die, and after that comes the judgment. The citizens of eternal hell will be a forgotten race by God and by man. Number six, will we become little gods in heaven? No, no, no. I know some of the Mormons think that, but it's not true. There's only one God. We won't know everything even in heaven. We'll still be living by faith, only God's omniscient. Number seven, will we be equal or the same in eternity? Wouldn't that be dull if we were all the same? I was in the airport the other day, and I watched a guy come through that uh, was dressed so badly, it was scary. Uh, not that he didn't have money. I mean, he was just dressed badly. And I thought to myself, that, that's, that's a clown. Boop, 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 boop. Just a clown. 
And then the Holy Spirit said, did you ever look at yourself in the mirror? <laughs> that guy's probably looking at you and saying, oh, man, is that drab? Is that ever dull? It would be a, it would be a rotten world without differences, wouldn't it? All the variety is great. How many of you like green vegetables? Hold up your hand. What's the matter with you? Man. God even warns you, it's green. Now some of you love it and then some of you say, you eat steak? Yes. Yes, well. God never meant for you to say, yes, he did. That's why he made cows out of meat. <laughs> Boy, there's some heavy theology for you. We have degrees of interest. In, in, some people like Picasso, some like Rembrandt, you know. Will there be variety in heaven? Oh, I hope so. I hope there will be. I wrote on page 15, uh, line 15, in eternity we'll celebrate variety. God himself is the creator of variety. Consider a massive African elephant. Now consider a duck-billed platypus. Did you ever see a duck-billed platypus? Looks like a little rat with a duck bill on it. God made that. God made that. Why? Because he loves variety. So just kind of look around you and think, boy, that person next to me, maybe not so weird after all. <laughs> what kind of bodies will we have in eternity? Some religions teach we'll become mere spirits or angels, but we Christians know from the Bible that we'll be blessed with transformed bodies just as Jesus had following his resignation or his resurrection. Remember, he didn't resign. His resurrection... <laughs> Remember that we, we are dead if he resigned. <laughs> it's amazing the way the mind. Mm. He is the prototype of us who will be resurrected from the dead. Praise the Lord. His body could be touched. He could eat. Yet he could all, it would also pass through solid walls and even ascend into the clouds. So Spider-Man eats your heart out. <laughs> you won't even need to have a web, praise the Lord. Will nature play a role in eternity? Oh yeah, yeah. God's gonna destroy this earth and build a whole new one. This is a gorgeous earth. Mercy is gorgeous. Down through the years, uh, I've had the joy of seeing so much of it, and I'm grateful more than I ever thought I'd get to see. You haven't seen a waterfall till you've stood on the edge of Victoria Falls that separates Zambia and Zimbabwe. You think Niagara Falls is great, and yes, I do. It's incredible. But it's, if you've seen, if you've ever seen Victoria Falls, oh, I, I stood there and watched it for hours. The Grand Canyon, been to the Grand Canyon? I've got a book in my library by a guy named Colin Fletcher. He's a professional hiker. And um, he decided to hike the canyon, not across it, but lengthwise. And it took him eight weeks to do it. He had three helicopter drops of food. And for eight weeks, he never heard a human voice. At the end of the book, he, he wrote, when he came up out of the canyon, just the ambient noise around him almost deafened him because he'd heard nothing for eight weeks. It's the beauty of the Grand Canyon. Fabulous. No matter where you go in this world, there are incredible things to see. Uh, I flew through Mount McKinley. Mount, Mount McKinley's the tallest mountain in America. It's up in Alaska. It's 21,000 feet. And I flew up there with a guy in a, in a supercharged cub, super cub, Piper cub. And um, 
I was preaching in the camp meeting in uh, Alaska, and Mount McKinley was 90 miles away. And it was one of those glorious days in Alaska when you could actually see the summit of Mount McKinley. It's usually bathed in mist and fog. But it was clear as a bell, beautiful, 21,000 feet. And I heard a noise, and I looked up, and here comes a guy flying low over the camp in this hilly camp in this super cub. They have big wheels on them about this high and extended wings and a huge engine on them. You guys that fly know about them. And he's looking for a place to land, and I thought, that guy's going to crash. There's no place to land here. And I watched him land on a sandbar. God hears me. I watched him, and you pilots know these guys can do this. I watched him land that sandbar on a sandbar at 35 miles an hour and only take about half the sandbar. So I watched him. He came up, and I said, man, wow. He said, right after lunch today, would you like to fly with me? It was a little two-seater front and back. Would you like to fly with me to the Mount McKinley? I said, you got that right. So as soon as we were done eating lunch, we ran out, and he pushed that plane back into the bush as far as it would go because we only got 100 feet. And I get in the back, and he says, you ready? I'm ready. So he locks the brakes, and he revs that thing up, that big engine. <laughs> that plane's just shaking. And he hollered back, here we go. And he released the brake, and maybe it was like a kite. just whoo. And we take off, and we're up to the, to the mountain. Now, that's a non-pressurized plane. So at 14,000 feet, you're pushing it because there's no oxygen after that much. And we're, we can't go to the summit, but we flew through canyons on top of Mount McKinley. And we, threw, we flew through these chasms where I thought we were going to get killed because the wings looked like they were reaching out, touching the sides. And we saw mountain goats standing at impossible angles and looking at this nut flying his airplane. <laughs> and soon he hollered back. He said, there's a meadow down there. And way down below, we saw this green little patch. He said, there's a lot of moose in there. We're going down. I thought, no, we're not. <laughs> I don't think we're going. And he put that thing into a, like, a, like a corkscrew and just went around and around. And we landed, and there's moose everywhere. Down. Incredible moose thinking, what in the world is that nutcake doing down here? And now he says, we got to go. So we get back in the plane, and we go back up. It was, wow. Think what heaven's going to be like. Wow. New heaven and a new earth. So will there be nature in heaven? Yes. Will there be music in heaven? I give you some things on that. Revelation 5, 9, they sang a new song. Sang a new song. Well, that's nothing new. Charismatic churches do that every service. They sing a new song that nobody knows. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll have music in heaven. Number 11, how old will we be in heaven? No, 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 no. There's no time. So how could you say how old somebody will be in eternity? There is no such thing as time. What language will we speak? Pastor Tito says Spanish. <laughs> I suspect we'll speak them all. Every language has ever been known. Because if God hears every language known and understands it, we shall be like him. Isn't that something? Number 13, isn't all this talk about heaven and eternity just escapism? You got that right. You got that right. C.S. Lewis said the only person who he ever met who was against escapism was a jailer. He wrote, is it escapist for a baby to wonder about life outside the womb? Is it escapist for someone on a long ocean voyage to wonder about landfall? Is it escapist for the seed to dream of the flower? Call it what you will. Our talk and dreaming of heaven is of the place God prepared for us. So do we want to escape this place where there's pain and sorrow and cessation of life, to go where everything is perfect and there'll be no pain, no death, no tears? Yes! Amen. 
Oh, gospel song, often I'm hindered on my way, burden so heavy I almost fall. Then I hear Jesus sweetly say, heaven will surely be worth it all. And the chorus is on the next page. Heaven will surely be worth it all, worth all the sorrows that here befall. After this life with all its strife, heaven will surely be worth it all. Now, there's a terrible misprint on line nine. There will be no second opportunities. I left out the no. Please don't pass this out without changing it. There will be no second opportunities for salvation. Revelation 22:10, verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. I often have well-meaning people say, come up to me and say, my, my loved one passed away, would you pray for him? I, there's no point. It's over. And that always comes as such a shock to them. Well, can't you pray for that person? So, no. It's useless. It's over. But the divine invitation still with us. Line 24, Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and the bride. Who's the bride? The church. The church is the bride of Christ. So the Holy Spirit and the bride say, as our missionaries are going to do in Jerusalem, come. If you're hearing, come. If you're thirsty, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Who's committed the unpardonable sin? Nobody who still wants to be saved. There is such a thing as the unpardonable sin, but if you'd committed it, you wouldn't even want to be saved. You'd be out of it. But whosoever will may come. Line 30, he which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. That didn't mean when John wrote that, that Jesus was coming in the next four days. It's that when he comes, you're out of here quickly in the twinkling of an eye. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. It's a tough subject to talk about eternity because you're dealing with this vast unknown that we only have hints about. But Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. You see all these things come to pass. I go to prepare a place for you. And if he's doing it, what do you want to bet? It's going to be pretty great. Pretty great. The question is always, are you ready for eternity? That's why we deal with the things that we deal with here at First Assembly. That's why missions is our priority. We're getting ready for eternity. I want you all to be ready. At the close of the service, I'm always down here. If I can help you or pray with you in any way, I want to do that. I want you to be ready for eternity. And I want you to meet our missionaries as they go to Jerusalem, to the holy city, which is not terribly holy right now. But they'll help make it holier. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Let's stand.